This is Walter Bosley, and I'll be reading a selection from Dream Gates, an explorer's guide to the worlds of soul, imagination, and life beyond death by Robert Moss. Visitors from Hyperspace We no longer have an agreed model by which to understand or explain encounters with visitors from a larger reality. In this respect, to quote Sir Edward Taylor again, we have indeed fallen from the high level of savage knowledge. Indigenous peoples recognize many kinds of other world beings and many passages between their realms and ours. They understand that the distance between dimensions is really no distance at all. Handsome Lake, the Seneca prophet, says the distance between our surface world and the world of the spirits is exactly as wide as the edge of the maple leaf. Dreaming peoples evolved a science and diplomacy of interdimensional travel. Unlike so many of our ufologists, they know this is a two-way traffic. We not only receive visitors from hyperspace, but we ourselves can journey to other worlds. Dreaming peoples also know that we must be able to close the doors between the worlds as well as open them, since not all beings from other dimensions are benign. A spokesman for one of the premier gatherings of UFO watchers, the U.S. Mutual UFO Network, announced in 1987 that after studying thousands of cases, the organization had concluded that just four types of aliens are visiting Earth. A human-like entity, a small humanoid, and two of their creations, a robot and a so-called experimental animal. We see what we are able to see. Perhaps we see that which we are. What a telling judgment on our condition it would be if we could see only, from the vast panoply of beings and forms in multidimensional reality, the four comic book figures approved by the Mutual UFO Network. But thankfully it is not so. With their eyes open or closed in their physical bodies or their dream bodies, People see beings of light and space invaders, shapeshifters, birdmen, giants and dwarfs, gods and demons, spirits of the departed, spirits of stone and stream, cones and towers of pulsating energy, light falls, fiery trees, and a window that opened on the inside of a star. The fairies of the air are different from those in the rocks, as an old Celtic woman told Evans Wentz. We are not alone. Once again, we are relearning what was common sense to our paleo ancestors and to many generations after them. We must get beyond the sterile black and white controversy between skeptics and UFO believers who think that extraterrestrials are coming among us in physical spaceships to conduct genetic experiments and or colonize the planet. In the vast literature on this subject, Jacques Vallée to my mind, has made the most important single contribution. Vallée argues that UFOs may be neither objects nor flying. They don't necessarily come from anywhere in space. They are not necessarily extraterrestrial. Similar sightings have been made throughout human history and have been explained according to the paradigms of each culture, as the manifestations of gods and spirits, as the work of magicians or fairies, why do these things appear to us now with such frequency? Paracelsus maintained that everything God creates manifests itself to man sooner or later. These beings appear to us in order for us to become able to understand them. And in understanding them, to revise our definitions of reality and reopen our accounts with possibility. In a third century Buddhist sutra, the Gandavyua. There is a fascinating account of how enlightened beings seek to guide us to higher consciousness and an expanded view of the nature of reality. It is the perennial task of certain beings, by virtue of their spiritual development, to help others to move beyond the restrictions of ordinary awareness in order to awaken to the full potential of mind. To perform their task, these teachers need to 
operate partly within the field of these same restrictions. To bring insight to where people live, they have to share their lives in their social and cultural environment. For this reason, the identity of the teacher is often deliberately obscured as he or she adapts to the needs and circumstances of the society in which he or she operates. Yet these teachers retain the ability to be beyond the world even while in the world, and retain the knowledge that the world as we know it is only a description. Acting from this knowledge, they are able to transform or suspend the deep structures of the description at will. How does this relate to UFO sightings and alien abductions? Perhaps in this way, that we have become so grossly enmeshed in material reality, so wedded to technological models, so divorced from the dreaming, that higher consciousness must pursue us in forms adapted to our limited conceptions of what is real. As Jung observed on, in his essay on flying saucers, anything that looks technological goes down without difficulty with modern man. UFOs and alien robots look technological until you look closer and discover that they behave more like ghosts or spirits. Can you hear someone saying, now that we have got your attention, we can begin to work on your definition of reality? You don't really know where you are unless you have traveled someplace else. So let us enrich our perspectives on this theme by considering those of three societies where journeys through hyperspace were well understood. The Vedic Science of Interdimensional Travel The social organization of the ancient Vedic peoples allowed for regular contact with higher beings to quote Richard Thompson's splendid book on this theme. As a result, Vedic literature contains a rich zoology of hyperspace. The Puranas refer to 400,000 human-like races that live among the planetary systems within contact range of humans. Some of these beings, gods, demons, and others, are more evolved than humans. Some are less so. Some are friendly to humans. Others detest the human race. Some intervene in human affairs, for good or bad. Others are sublimely indifferent. Whatever their differences, most of these beings have something in common. They are more powerful and more intelligent than humans. In the Vedic sources, these humanoid species are attributed special powers, or siddhis that are magical to ordinary humans, but may be developed by an advanced yogi or seer. They can communicate across vast distances by pure thought. They can fold time and space and travel from one point in the cosmos to another without being impeded by physical objects or the laws of physics. They practice teleportation. They are capable of transporting physical bodies from one place to another without crossing the intervening space. Though the Sanskrit sources do not use a term that can be directly translated as dimension, it should be noted that the power of teleportation, prapti city it is called, the ability to move through physical objects, called viahasa, and the power to materialize or dematerialize at will, known as manojava, would all be characteristic of multidimensional beings playing hide-and-seek with a species embedded in a 3D reality. One further attribute of our visitors from hyperspace in the Vedic accounts is that they are prodigious shapeshifters, able to show themselves in many forms. The Vedic cosmos is multi-layered. There are 14 inhabited realms, or lokas, seven below the earth and seven above it. As you will already know, if you have become an active dreamer, you will bump into a ceiling or impenetrable wall as you go upward until you are able to adjust your frequency to go higher. It is easier to travel down than up, so to speak, although beings from higher levels rarely choose to descend into the miasma of the sublunar planes. The highest level is Brahmaloka, the realm of Brahma. Below this are levels inhabited by sages who cultivate transcendental knowledge and consciousness. Below them is 
Svargaloka, the realm of the devas, or gods, whose wars with lower forces impact humans. Some beings actively rebel against the cosmic hierarchy, and sometimes interfere dramatically in human affairs. Between gods and humans are intermediate races that are neutral or hostile to man. The higher orders of beings use vimanas, vehicles whose flight patterns will interest students of UFO sightings, vehicles that fly through the air, sometimes visible, sometimes invisible. They can move in any element. They turn at impossible angles. They appear in the sky like whirling firebrands and disappear in less than the blink of an eye. They can change the weather, producing twisters, lightning bolts, hailstones. In the Vedic accounts, visitors from hyperspace appear to humans for many different reasons. Some come to help and guide, some to meddle. Sexual attraction plays a large role in the epic stories and is a leading cause of alien abductions. The daughter of the Naga king kidnaps Arhuna after she becomes infatuated with him. Visitors from hyperspace also show up because they are called in. The, Bhagav the Bhagavata Purana contains a riveting scene of a ritual at the court of a king. As the priests vibrate, mantras, gods, and Gandharvas and celestial seers gather to join in the ceremonies. Scottish Crossings Robert Kirk, a 17th century Anglican vicar at Aberfoyle in Scotland, wrote a remarkably detailed account of the other world, its inhabitants, and their intercourse with living human beings. Kirk's Secret Commonwealth is not another collection of folklore and popular beliefs, but a rigorous study, scientific by the standards of its day, that is clearly grounded in experience. Its main interest today is that it describes a secret way of correspondence with the invisible world, a means of crossing between ordinary and inordinary reality at will. Kirk subtitled his work, An Essay of the Nature and Actions of the Subterranean for the Most Part Invisible People, heretofore going by the names of elves, fauns, and fairies, and the like. By subterranean, he does not mean creatures living in dark, gloomy places in the bowels of the earth. This realm is full of light, though it is not lit by any sun. They live in cavities and may pass wherever air may go. The earth is full of cavities and cells and everywhere is inhabited. There is no such thing as pure wilderness in the whole universe. Though invisible to most humans, the inhabitants of these realms are not disembodied. They have light-changeable bodies, like those called astral, somewhat of the nature of a condensed cloud. They are best seen at twilight. They shapeshift and can make their bodies of congealed air appear and disappear at will. The fairies are of a middle nature betwixt man and angel like the demons of the ancient world. They are mortal in the sense that they pass from their existing state, but they live far longer than a human lifespan. They are strongly connected to the earth and special places within the earth. They tend to show themselves in the costume of the country and speak its language. Kirk discusses rival opinions in his parish about whether the so-called good people are spirits of the departed, clothed in their subtle bodies, or exuded forms of the man approaching death, or a numerous people by themselves. He suggests that all these descriptions may be valid for different phenomena. Just beyond the borders of everyday perception is a vast and varied population. Encounters with the fairies can be dangerous. They are known to abduct humans into their realm. Those who enter the other world willingly may have a hard time getting back. Some inhabitants of the invisible realm are hostile to humans, and some seek to feed on the energy of the living. However, the peoples of the secret commonwealth take a close interest in human affairs, and our lives are closely related to theirs. 
One of Kirk's most intriguing observations is that each of us has a double who is fully at home in the other world. The old Scots Gaelic term for this double is koimime, which means co-walker. Kirk improvises a series of synonyms for the double, including twin, companion, echo, reflex man, and living picture. The double resembles the living person both before and after she or he dies. The double survives physical death when the co-walker goes at last to his own land. When invited, the co-walker will make itself known and familiar, but most people are unaware that they have a double. Since it lives in a different element, it neither can nor will easily converse with the everyday waking mind. Your double may be seen by others. Kirk gives several examples of someone's double entering a house shortly before the person himself arrived, of sightings of the double of a person who had just died, or was soon to die, of the perception of the subtle form of a lover or spouse standing close to the loved one, of a woman who observed her second self walking ahead of her as if as she left her home. Kirk also offers clues to the possible influence of the co-walker, even unrecognized and unperceived in a person's life. He cites the Scots' belief that someone who eats great quantities of food without putting on weight is being joined in the gourmandise by a joint eater, or girt coimeth. Maybe there is a tip here for a new weight loss program. Rereading The Secret Commonwealth while I was preparing this book, I asked for dream guidance to clarify exactly what Robert Kirk means by co-walker. In my dream, I acquired a suede coat, identical to the coat I most often wear when flying around the world or traveling to my active dreaming workshops. In my dream, I carried both these garments, swapping them according to circumstances. The dream confirmed my suspicion that Kirk is writing about the dream double. Unfortunately, he tells us little about dreaming, where the double is most easily perceived. Kirk speculates that everything may have its double, a tantalizing hint of the existence of what I have called counterpart reality. How can we know the truth about these things? Through the art and science of seeing, Robert Kirk describes the practice of the Scottish seer as he was able to understand and enter it. The seer is able to make spirits visible to himself and others. He is able to cross into the other world and return at his choosing. Kirk includes a curious report of a seer who was seen to vanish, body and soul, from a certain spot and reappear an hour later some distance from the point of his crossing. The gift of seeing runs in certain families, but many of the most powerful seers receive their calling directly from the spirits. Their initiatory visions are often wild and shamanic. They fall into fits and raptures. The gift of seeing brings the ability to look into subtler orders of reality and perceive things that, for their smallness or subtlety and secrecy, are invisible to others, even though they are intermeshed with them. The seer is accompanied by an inner light that can be focused and directed, a beam continually about him as that of the sun. Kirk's description of the Tabseer's beam closely parallels Inuit accounts of the shaman light of the Angakok. Kirk provides an interesting account of a seer's initiation. He winds a cord of human hair around his middle in the shape of a helix. He bends down and looks backward between his legs. The object of his gaze may be a funeral procession moving over a border crossing. Or it may be a hole in a tree, like the hole left in a fir tree when a knot has gone. Kirk describes how a seer can provide a layman with temporary access to the sight. The apprentice places one foot on the seer's foot while the seer lays a hand on the apprentice's head so that the would-be seer is enclosed within the Teb seer's body space as well as his energy field. As he looks over the seer's right shoulder, the apprentice is supposed to see a multitude of beings rushing toward him through the air. The gifts of seeing include the ability to fold time and space. 
Kirk cautions, as any good practitioner would, about the difficulty of interpreting and working with some of these sightings. He recounts the case of a woman with the sight who foresaw a seaborne attack on her island in the Hebrides, but was confused about whether the soldiers in the boat were hostile or friendly, and even whether they were coming or going with good reason, since they had stolen a barge from her island and were rowing toward it with their backs to the shore. As a man of the church, Kirk goes to great lengths to argue that there is nothing ungodly about correspondence with the other world beings, quoting reports of visionary experiences in the Bible. He also contends that it is as natural to encounter the inhabitants of the other world as it is to go fishing. Both involve moving into another element. He reassures us that we are dealing with an invisible people, guardian over and careful of man, whose courteous endeavor is to convince us of the reality of the spiritual world and of a possible and harmless method of correspondence betwixt men and them, even in this life. According to local tradition, Robert Kirk paid for his knowledge. He was reputedly taken by the fairies in 1692 into a fairy knoll across a little valley from his church. Villagers were still pointing out the site centuries later. Were the fairies annoyed with him for revealing their secrets, or had they fallen in love with him? Maybe the tale was concocted by people who wanted to spook their neighbors into keeping away from personal exploration of the unseen. Some say the fairies took Kirk's body and soul. Some say only the soul. A related tradition says that he had a means of coming back from the other world that depended on the actions of a cousin to whom he announced it in a dream. But the cousin lost his nerve when he saw the clergyman's double appear in the church at a baptism. So Robert Kirk remained on the other side. This is Walter Bosley, and I just read a selection from Dreamgates by Robert Moss.